Welcome, if you're on Facebook or Zoom, Facebook Live or Zoom. For those of you here in person, please take this moment, if you haven't already, to ensure that your cell phones are silenced. Thank you very much. We'll begin our Wednesday evening service with a pre-service meditation. So I invite you to get still, close your eyes, and simply follow your breath. And if you feel comfortable, chant along silently, God is the love that I am. And if your mind wanders, which it may or may not,
So as our meditation has come to a close, gently bring your awareness back to your surroundings, into your body, and if you feel ready, open your eyes. Welcome to the, those of you who have joined us while our meditation was in, pra, in progress. We're so glad you could have you here with us virtually and or in person. So let's settle into the peace of a moment in this beautiful sanctuary. I claim that there is one life, one presence, one truth, one love, one life. That life is God's life. It is my life. It is your life. It is our life right now. God is the good to which there's no opposite. God is the river, the flow of consciousness within us, within everyone, everywhere that connects us all, that inner divine spark of grace and beauty and balance and harmony, divine wisdom and infinite intelligence, always present, always available. Our heart, our soul, and our mind are open to this as we receive what is to be given to us tonight through the word of our luminous Reverend Sidney Steen. Our hearts are uplifted and fulfilled by the music of our musical director, Sam Krieger, and the resplendent musical stylings of Darius Lux. I am so grateful to know that we are here together to receive, and we are buoyed fulfilled, sustained, and nurtured by this flow, by this consciousness that we each share in, knowing that it fulfills and nurtures and sustains us in so many immeasurable ways. It is the changeless, changeless, eternal, limitless, unending flow of goodness into our lives. I'm grateful for this and knowing that it is so for each and every one of us, no matter where we are, what we do, what we say, who we meet, this is the truth for us at all times. So in claiming and affirming that for each of us, I say, thank you, God. I'm eternally grateful to know this fact. My faith is unwavering. I am so blessed to know that I am a part of the overall divine wisdom and infinite intelligence. I release this word into the law of mind, knowing that it is so. And together we can say, amen. Amen. Let's sing our opening chant, God is in this place, led by Darius Lux. Anybody notice besides the musicians that I went out of order? <laughs> All right. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. That's in order right now. <laughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and power and glory forever. Amen.
Well, they said you can't So you say goodbye Took a one-way ride In search of brighter skies You change your name Then you change your face Built a wall around yourself To make a safer place And you do the very best That you can with a hand you've been dealt Put on a face so brave And I see the way you hurt When you take on the weight of the world To keep your dreams alive So take your time Till it feels right We have forever Don't keep it all inside I believe in you So when you need to hide Don't turn away from me Just let your beauty shine It's a peaceful night as we lay outside Though I feel your heart is restless You just pretend it's fine But the scream inside Is the loudest cry I wish you'd set those feelings free Put down that foolish pride And I know how hard it is To tell the difference between friends and foes To trust that helping hand And the darkness that you see Is that a help guide your way to the light Where you can truly shine So take your time Till it feels right Thank you, thank you. Give it up again. Yeah. Wow. Well, welcome. I'm glad you're here. I am Reverend Sydney Steen. I am the assistant minister. And um, we're here to play Jeff. No, that's not what I was. I don't know why I said that. All right. So, how is your um, ability to receive? How are you doing with that? Excellent. All right. Well, I know you are. <laughs> Scale of 1 to 10. 10 being, I have all that I need, and I know it. It's automatic, and I get it. 1 being, oh. <laughs> I, I, so 1 to 10. Seven. Seven's good. What else? Okay. So we got a 6. What else we got? You guys are, uh, what's that? Okay, well, you know what? Then I'm just going home. <laughs> Thank you. Well, then, listen, I'm just going to come on down. He's a four, so we've got a message here to give. All right. Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote, The ancestor to every action is a thought. 
the ancestor to every action is a thought. And I really liked that idea because everything that goes on in our world, everything that we do, everything that happens in our lives is a result of a, let's call it a parent thought or an ancestor thought. It is that thing which has acted as cause, has acted as the creator, right? And we are the product of the creator. We have within us all that the creator is. Wayne Dyer likes to say, chip off the old block. That's what we are, okay? God, the senior partner, let's do that. Um, Johnny Coleman, Reverend Dr. Johnny Coleman used to say, I am the thinker that thinks the thought that makes the thing. So get that, I am the thinker that thinks the thought that makes the thing, okay? So we have so much choice and so much power and so much ability in all of this, and yet we often have residual stuff that's going on that we're participating in that is perhaps not doing that not, not bringing us the this, this stuff that we're thinking about, you know, where we think I'm the thinker who thinks the thought that, that makes the thing. And I've been thinking a lot about this dream over here and this over here. And where is it? Where is it, God? Come on now. Where is it? And yet we work on it. You know, we, anybody have vision boards? You have your, your treasure maps. You have, we used to call them, um, Oh, we call them something else. It doesn't matter. But we have all these pictures and, and we have these ideas and we write our affirmations and we've got affirmations sticking all over the mirrors and in the windshield and we've got all of this stuff when you open up your books or you lift up the lid of the toilet, there's another affirmation. <laughs> no, not, you guys don't do that? All right. Um, so we do all that and yet, where is it? Where is it, God? Where is it? How come it's not happening? And I believe that there's a root idea. There's a core idea that we really truly need to get to and we get to do it over and over and over again. And as I've said many times, I don't make up the rules. I don't even enforce them. But what I've noticed that spiritual nature and spiritual understanding comes by degrees. It comes by increments. And it also comes, ah, it's not a steady uphill thing. We go up we slip back a little. We go up, we slip back a little. We go up, we slip back a little bit. And we get to live as the onion of our lives where we just keep peeling and we think, oh, I thought I healed this sense of I'm ready to receive and I'm able to receive. But look, there it is again. And then we peel more of the onion. We peel more of the onion. And there are a lot of tears in this onion called life, right? So I know that our world is very much attached to the idea that receiving is it just another word for getting. Getting, having, taking, right? We tend to be very much invested in the idea that receiving is first and foremost connected to material manifestations and tangible goods. You know, um, new thought teachings sadly have the reputation for being the, the vending machine, the get rich quick kind of uh, teachings because we do talk about our abundant nature. We talk about prosperity. And yet, if all we're doing is defining our abundance and our prosperity in terms of our materiality, we are completely, sorry about that, we are completely missing the boat on what it means to be demonstrations and reflection of, of, of the abundant nature that God is because it is so much more than that. It's not about the stuff. Now look, I am as material as anybody. You know, you all have been around long enough and you know me well enough to know that I like my stuff and I do like my shoes in particular. But it's not about the shoes, it's not about the stuff. However, once we get that idea and we realize that there's a deeper understanding to be had and there's a deeper peace to be realized and expressed, the paradox is that, yeah, we begin to have all the stuff we need. We have the stuff we need. So when we stop caring about the stuff, we begin to understand that there's a greater idea. You know, as in so many esoteric and spiritual, spiritual teachings, what we teach here about receiving 
Well, is always going to center upon our first of our knowing and living from our connection with God or infinite source, whatever it is, whatever your concept or name for God is. That, that, great, that great wisdom, that infinite invisible. And, you know, we spend more time here at this church than probably any other church or spiritual center I think I've ever been around. Because when we know who we are, and we begin to identify as that divine, as that magnificence, not only do our lives get better, but we have more to play with. And so other people's lives get better too, because we get to play with them with that sense of well-being and knowing and peace. And you've heard Dr. Mark say many times that no one ever gets healed by withholding, right? We don't, we don't, make the world better by our withholding. We don't make somebody else whole and healthy because we tend, we think, well, there's only enough health for me or, or for them, so I'm going to sit here in my sickness. You know, can you imagine if, if there was this anthropomorphic God saying, you know, there's only so much oxygen I feel like producing today. So you guys over here, you get to breathe. You guys over here, yeah, you're going to be gasping. It's not like that. We live in this infinite, infinite universe that is constantly expanding and expressing as itself, as that which needs to be expressed, as that which needs to be experienced, as that which needs to be created. So, you know, the, the historical practice of Orthodox religion has been about our worm in the dust value, right? You and I, worm in the dust. But that's not what we believe here, and that's certainly not what we teach. Instead, what we teach is that the basis for our self-worth and our self-identification is anchored completely, completely in our identification with and as the divine higher self, that divine higher self. The simp simply put, what's true about God is true about you and me. Now, that's an oversimplification in many ways, and yet it's the fundamental truth. You know, we, we, think, we hear that, and it feels really good to hear that. What's true about God is true about me. Oh, my goodness. That's a powerful, amazing idea. Yet, how long do we live in it? How long do we live in it, and how long do we accept it? How much do we live as it? Are we able to assume it? Assume a virtue, though you have it not, as Shakespeare said. How long are we able to assume that and live from that so that it begins to become organic to our very nature? And that's what we, we go to in our education, in our teaching, in our contemplation, in our meditation, is to begin to put on the garment of God. We put on the garment of the divine. And look how well it fits. It fits beautifully. It fits just exactly like your own skin. And sometimes we might be uncomfortable in our own skin, but the truth is we are wearing the garment of God. We are dressed in the garment of the divine. You know, it's this basic premise. If we believe we aren't good enough and, we don't deserve, and that we don't deserve joy, good, abundance, health, love, or creative fulfillment, then correspondingly, because it is done unto us as we believe, then we're not going to experience all of that stuff. We're not going to experience joy, good, abundance, health, love, or creative fulfillment. And so we know that. You know, it's, it's interesting how much of our, how that part of our emotional, our psychological, and our spiritual growth gets skipped over. You know, that, that we are the thinkers who think the thought that make the thing that we have choice, that we have agency, we have responsibility, we have accountability, we have spiritual agency, and we have that full faith, credit, permission here and now. There's no one we have to go through to get it. We are just here as it. But we often go right to the affirmations and the treasure maps and the pictures and the images because we want the goodies, right? We don't want to do the work because we really want to get that stuff now. We want to feel better now. We want to be out of the pain now. We want to have the love now, the relationships, the job. We want all of that now. And ah, what we do here is put a foundation under all of that so that 
when you begin to have that stuff expressing in your life, it can stay there. So you can stay in that awareness. You know, this, it's not a wishful thinking teaching, science of mind, new thought. It's not, oh God, I hope I get this. And then I hope when I get it, I'm good enough to let it stay. I hope I don't screw it up so it goes away. And then I have to try and get it again. It's not that. It's that we do the deeper work to really, really look at the ideas that perhaps we grew up with, the worm and the dust stuff, and let it go. Dissolve it. Interrogate it. Is it really true? So that we can live in that complete knowing of our ability our worthiness to receive. You know, when we do know ourselves as chips off the old block of God, we get to begin to understand that we are elevated expressions of the Most High. So then begins the journey as we seek to reconcile what might have been, what we might have been raised with, you know, the unworthiness, the shame, the worm in the dust stuff, the, the divine, sorry, the, the less than, the not good enough. And we we begin to replace all of that with the divine truth, the divine truth of who we are, beloved, cherished, anointed beings of God itself. Now, I think that not all of us grew up that way. I think that our choice is that we can choose to really pursue that really pursue it and find those corners of our thinking where we don't believe it. Or we can stay in the familiar, the wishful thinking place, and it's safe, it's, you know, it's, we know, they know us there in the pain zone, right? But we can be spiritual, live from our spiritual identity or from the constrictions of human indemnity. And I think a lot of us grew up and we're still trying to shake off the shackles of human indemnity. That's that worm in the dust stuff. And so I mentioned uh, Wayne Dyer early, cause I, or earlier because I really, there are times I so resonate with what he has written. And since I'm talking about this whole idea of receiving, I really wanted to come up with a way to convey that this is, it's a much greater idea than, yes, I'm open, yes, I'm open, yes, I'm open. It's so much greater than that. So if you'll bear with me, I'm going to share some of the stuff that he wrote in his book, The Power of Intention, because it touched me so much today. A fundamental attribute of the supreme originating power is kindness. All that's manifest, manifested is brought here to thrive. It takes a kindly power to want what it creates to thrive and multiply. Were this not the case, then all that's created would be destroyed by the same power that created it. In order to reconnect to intention, and that's of course the book, you must be on the same kindness wavelength as intention itself. Now, this idea of intention is not that's, that's my intention, that's my choice, that's my, that's my goal, that's my dream. Inten instead, he's talking about intention in a greater idea, a greater concept, a greater knowing that the intention of God is life itself. And it is a field to which we are fully connected, always connected, and yet we seldom live from it or if we do live from it, we don't do it as richly, perhaps, as we possibly could. That this is the vitality of life. This is what you might call energy, the field of pure potentiality. It is intention. It is the divine... Mm. It is that divine intention of life. It is that which stands as source and substance. It is that which swirled and so needed to express, so needed to create, that that energy of creation main, is, is remaining and is maintained. And meanwhile, the Big Bang happened over here and life begins to unfold. Life begins to unfold. And so what we want to do here 
is be able to learn the ways in which we can connect to that master, you know, that God, the senior partner intention, that power and presence on a more consistent basis so that we know exactly who we are and that we can live from that and that we can speak our word from that and that we can be vitalized by it, that we can be joyful in it and as it. That's what we want to do. Are, are, we, are we here? Are we awake? Are we taking it? Okay, don't go to sleep on me because um, I really want you to get that this power and presence is that intention for life. It absolutely is the master intention for life. And master, not master commander, but the, that which has premacy is the creative energy of life itself. We call it God. We call it God. Low energy thoughts that weaken us fall in the realm of shame, anger, hatred, judgment, and fear. Each of these inner thoughts weakens us and inhibits us from attracting into our lives what we desire. Oh, that's what it is. Thought is a magnet. It's done unto us as we believe. And since what we are, what we think about is what our lives become, what we focus on creates that. Thought creates, right? Life is an expression of that which we believe, cause and effect. Our thought is the cause. That which we believe is going to create the lives that we are living because all of that is the simple truth that it is done unto us as we believe. If we are focused on those areas where we do not have, where we need to receive, I need to receive, I need to receive, then the universe and its wonderful, wonderful, brilliant, perfect, reflective intelligence says, you need to receive, you need to receive, you need to receive. And so our goal then is to move from this consciousness of identifying ourselves as, I want to receive, or I want this, I want this, and the universe gives us more reasons to want something because we have identified ourselves now as wanters, and the universe goes, yes, you are a wanter, I get that, you are wanting. Instead of that, we step into this realm of I am that creation of the divine in whom the creator is well pleased, though we don't believe it. And with every time that we practice that thought and something comes up, that's where we look at that thought and say, okay, I don't want this in my life anymore. This has been operational up till now. I'm not going there. I, don't, I didn't come here for that. You came here to be the expression of this power and this presence. You didn't come here to be limited and to be fearful and to live in want or lack or limitation. So we become what we think about. So are we cont contemplating human indemnity or are we dwelling in this energy of our shared divinity, our spiritual identity? This is why we talk so much about spiritual practice because it is about letting go of the distractions of not enough, letting go of the distractions of the world identifying us as or defining us as not enough, letting go of the beliefs that our parents or teachers or whoever instilled in us and said, you're not enough, you're not worthy. And instead we move into the fullness of this idea of right where I am, God is. Everywhere equally present, everywhere equally present, everywhere equally present. This is the life that we are here to live. Receiving isn't a one time or one, um, a one off and on idea, right? It's not a one off. It, the goal is to become so immersed in, in, in the God everywhere equally present and fully and limitlessly active knowing that there's no place that we, you know, as, as you've heard, there's no spot where God is not. Because we begin to realize, I can't go anywhere without God being there. God got there first. And God is who I am. You know, this idea of we are that, that atom or that circle or that little bit of God in the big, big ocean of God. You know, Rumi had it in the 13th century. So... If we truly want to rise above this indemnity consciousness that surrounds us, we have to choose to evolve. 
we have to begin to be gatekeepers, you know, really conscious gatekeepers and stewards of our own thinking, of our own minds. Because the world out there, and even, let's be honest, a lot of our family and our friends, they're going to try to limit us only because that's what they know. That's just what they know. That's their experience. And when you and I start to shake loose of that, it's a little threatening to them. Hell, it's threatening to us, right? When we go through it ourselves, it puts us in a zone where we haven't been before. But part of our evolution, I think, is that we go from being a getter or a taker of stuff to being a giver of compassion and kindness. We can move, and then from being a giver of compassion and kindness, we move to living as a knower of connection and oneness, right? So we start with the getting. We move into the giving. Then we move into the knowing. And then we, when we move from that, we move from being a knower of our shared oneness, we move into being receivers of guidance, of inspiration, of peace. We become receivers of that energy, those ideas, those impulses, that emergence of life that is seeking to express through us in brilliance, in radiance, in power, and joy, in delight, in humor, in fun. And perhaps the ultimate movement in our evolution is that we choose to go from receiver to receptive. And in that consciousness, we find our true home and our true identity is love and expression. You know, Ernest Holmes wrote, life reveals itself to whomever is receptive to it. Life reveals itself to whomever is receptive to it. And so our receptivity is so much bigger than our receiving. And our receptivity is so fundamentally connected to our value, our knowing of who we are. Because if we don't think we are beings worthy of receiving, we won't be beings of receiving, worthy of receiving. If we don't think we are beings of great value, of expressions of the divine self with a capital S, then we will not be those beings that we want to be. But the truth is, we're already there. So, so much of life is the uncovering of those filters that we have been holding on to. And most of us don't even know we have those filters there, right? We don't even know that that's, that's the belief I've been carrying. Holy cow, it's been showing up as this experience or this limitation. We don't want that. And then when we, when we begin to say, I want to live as that full power and presence. I want to have that full vital experience of God in every fiber of my being. I am that full of experience of God in every fiber of my being. Every fiber of my being. There is a resonant energy that begins to happen. There's a resonant, a higher vibration. And we begin to vibrate at the speed of God, right? We begin to vibrate at the level of life. We begin to vibrate at the level of life itself. I was talking about this last night in our class that Charles Fillmore said that prayer is the way in which we activate and increase our speed. It's basically an, an increase in how we speed up to God. It's an acceleration of consciousness so that we are now accelerated from this human indemnity place to the spiritual identity place, right? We are accelerating the awareness. We are accelerating our ability to understand, to know, to receive, to be willing, to be receptive, and to give. We know it's not about materialism. Our ability is to, that we want to cultivate is to understand, embrace, and live from this basis, the spiritual basis. And the willing, the, the receptivity we have to cultivate is along the lines of our willingness to consciously, our willingness to consciously take time to connect with source, right? I am the thinker that thinks the thought that makes the things. I am the thinker. And to recognize that there's actually something thinking through us. Will we be open to it? Will we receive it? Because the receiving, the greater receiving happens from within. 
It's not happening here. It's happening from within. Our big goal is to be receptive to our oneness with God. That's what we are here to receive. Because from that, our wholeness is so clearly defined and so clearly celebrated by means of us, means of us because I know a lot of you know that the universe only has one answer. And what's that answer? Yes. So as we say, yes, I am going to accelerate to the level of the divine yes, then our lives begin to reflect that. So I just want to share with you a story that so opened my heart today. And, and more than any yammering on that I can do, really clearly showed me what it means to live a, a life of heart and intention, to be receptive, to be knowing, to, be, to participate with God. To participate with God, to participate in life as God. Okay, so just bear with me. In Brooklyn, New York, CHUSH, C-H-U-S-H, is a school that caters to learning disabled children. Some children remain in that school for their entire school career, while others can be mainstreamed into conventional schools. At a CHUSH fundraiser dinner, the father of a CHUSH child delivered a speech that would never be forgotten, forgotten by all who attended. After extolling the school and its dedicated staff, he cried out, where is the perfection in my son, Shia? Everything God does is done with perfection, but my child cannot understand things as other children do. My child cannot remember facts and figures as other children do. Where is God's perfection? The audience was shocked by the question, pained by the father's anguish, and stilled by the piercing query. I believe, the father answered, that when God brings a child like this into the world, the perfection that he seeks is in the way people react to his child. He then told the following story about his son, Shia. One afternoon, Shia and his father walked past a park where some boys Shia knew were playing baseball. Shia asked, do you think they'll let me play? Shia's father knew that his son was not at all athletic and that most boys would not want him on their team. But Shia's father understood that if his son was chosen to play, it would give him a sense of belonging. Isn't that what we all want, this community? Shia's father approached one of the boys on the field and asked if Shia could play. The boy looked around for guidance from his teammates. Getting none, he took matters into his own hands and said, we're losing by six runs and the game is in the eighth inning. I guess he can be on our team and we'll try to put him up to bat in the ninth inning. Shia's father was ecstatic as Shia smiled broadly. Shia was told to put on a glove and go out to play in center field. In the bottom of the eighth inning, Shia's team scored a few runs but was still behind by three. In the bottom of the ninth inning, Shia's team scored again and now had two outs and the bases loaded with a potential winning run on base That's, and Shia was scheduled to be up. Would the team actually let him bat at this juncture and give away their chance to win the game? Surprisingly, Shia was given the bat. Everyone knew that it was all but impossible because Shia didn't even know how to hold the bat properly, let alone hit with it. However, as he stepped up to the plate, the pitcher moved a few steps to lob the ball in softly so Shia could at least be able to make contact. The first pitch came in and Shia swung clumsily and missed. One of Shia's teammates came up to Shia and together they held the bat and faced the pitcher waiting for the next pitch. The pitcher again took a few steps forward to toss the ball softly towards Shia. As the pitch came in, Shia and his teammates swung the bat, and together they hit a slow ground ball to the pitcher. The pitcher picked up the soft grounder and could easily have thrown the ball to the first baseman. Shia would have been out, and that would have ended the game. Instead, the pitcher took the ball and threw it on a high arc to right field far beyond the reach of the first baseman. Everyone started yelling, Shia, run to first, run to first. Never in his life had Shia run to first. He scampered down the baseline, wide-eyed and startled. By the time he reached first base, the right fielder had the ball. 
He could have thrown the ball to second baseman who would tag out Shia, who was still running. But the right fielder understood what the pitcher's intentions were. So he threw the ball high and far over the third baseman's head. Everyone yelled, run to second, run to second. Shia ran towards second base as the runners ahead of him deliriously circled the bases toward home. As Shia reached second base, the opposing shortstop ran to him, turned him in the direction of third base and shouted, run to third. As Shia rounded third, the boys from both teams ran behind him screaming, Shia, run home. Shia ran home, stepped on home plate, and all 18 boys lifted him on their shoulders and made him the hero as he had just hit a grand slam and won the game for his team. That day, said the father softly with tears now rolling down his face, those 18 boys reached their level of God's perfection. You and I have the choice daily to reach our level of God's perfection, to reveal that level of God's perfection, to become so receptive to the possibilities of kindness, of compassion, of giving love, of giving space, of holding space, that we become those angels of love and that we actually create the shift that I'm pretty sure we all believe the world wants and the world is longing for. So I want to invite you this week, instead of looking for those ways in which, how can I receive this? How, what do I need to do to become more, more godlike, more willing? We become godlike by recognizing that the person in front of us is God. And we give to that person. We give our hearts. We give our vulnerability. We give the understanding that we are one, that we are one. And no matter where that person is on their path, no matter where they are, no matter who they voted for or what they believe, we are one. And as we give, as we mm, step beyond any of those limitations that we think we might have and begin to express the truth of God, we walk each other home in love and in peace. And in that, we heal the planet. Let's pray. Thank you. Oh, how good it is to know that we can choose to be awake and aware to those better angels of our thoughts and to look beyond all the work that we think we might need to do, all the growth that we have to do, all the stuff that we have to do, all of the, all of the stuff that we can choose to step, step aside from that and just simply open our hearts to the greater good, to the greater possibility, to the greater presence and power that already holds us, loves us, whispers in our ear, my darling, I love you, share my love. So I know for each of us that we stay open this week, that we walk through this world with a sense of knowing that we are on a mission to remind not just ourselves but everyone else that there is only one, only one, and we are one with that one. How good it is to know that we have the agency, the ability, and the choice to do that. I know that we are receptive to these ideas, and we allow them to lift us up into, oh, the magnificence that seeks to celebrate us, that seeks to partner with us, and we say yes. We say yes to recognizing the wholeness throughout all life. We say yes to living in that wholeness. We say yes to holding our hearts and our arms around Ukraine, around Russia, around all beings everywhere, around this country, around this nation, around our leaders, around every person, every being. We say yes to remembering that 
we are one and that right where we are God is and God is saying my beloved love each other now and all that you have need of is already there for you see it be it now is the time and place so I'm grateful to know that we we are aware and that we are living in that field of quantum yes how grateful we all can be in that field of quantum yes so I know that we are a blessing in the world. We are a blessing to ourselves. And I know that everywhere we go, we step into a field ah, that has already been prepared for us with infinite joy and love. And I know this for myself. I know this for all people. And I invite you to say with me, I accept these truths for myself and all beings everywhere. And we do accept these truths. And we let this word go into the law, that law of God knowing it is already done we are the thinker that thinks the thoughts that makes the things and we are grateful we let it be so and so it is and together we say amen thank you very much Yes, I'm only here for God. No more struggle, no more strife. With my faith, I see the light. I am free in the spirit. Yes, I'm only here for God. I release and I let go. Let the spirit run my life. And my heart is open wide. Yes, I'm Yes, I'm only here for God. Yes, I'm only here for God. Yes, I'm only here for God. Yay, yay, yay. So I invite you to take your offering in your hand. And if you do this online or you're going to drop it in the box later, whatever it is, this is when we invite you to participate in this community, by the way. Take a moment and just look around and see each other's eyes, okay? Just look around and look at each other. Really look at each other. This is why we have intentional giving, so that we can continue to love each other, continue to be here for each other, to serve. And it's part of how we move into that knowing of receiving, exactly as Shia's teammates did. We give. So I invite you to take that gift or the idea of that, that gift and say with me, from the love of pure spirit within me, I bless this gift. I send it forth to heal and bless and prosper. It is evidence of my faith and belief. It does good work in the world and returns to me multiplied abundantly. And so it is.
I was about to go out of order again. I guess I am anyways. <laughs> That's all a work in progress. Practice, practice, practice. Thank you, Reverend Sidney. Thank you, Sam Krieger, Darius Lux. The melo melodious dulcet tones of Darius Lux, if you enter his name, L-U-X, into a search engine, whatever you use, you'll find him. All right. I am the messenger, and I have the announcements. We do make it easy for you to make donations to our church. You can text GIVE to the, the text to GIVE number and QR code are on your program or go to nhcrs.org slash GIVE. We have a wonderful community here. There are many ways to give and receive here. One of them is prayer with a practitioner after service right here in person or, and or on Zoom. Next Wednesday, Wednesday evening service with practitioner Liz Racy. She is energetic and wonderful. Meditation at 6.50 p.m., service at 7. Join Liz next week as she shares on the topic, the design spark, the design spark, the divine spark, it lives in you. Men's group, the group meets this Sunday at 11 a.m. in the Ernest Holmes Room and on Zoom. All men are welcome. Women's group, this group meets this Sunday at 1 p.m. in the Youth Church and on Zoom. All women are welcome. There is still time to sign up for Dr. Mark's Abundance Workshop, Mondays through August 22nd on Zoom only. Dr. Mark brings over 30 years of experience and wisdom to this amazing workshop where you'll learn how to expand your prosperity consciousness. Class meets from 6.30 to 8 and is based on the book Spiritual Economics by Eric Butterworth. Sign up online. Cost is responsible giving. And the book is available in the bookstore. Hey, first time in three years, walk the labyrinth. Come one, come all. Support your soul with the peace and blessing of a labyrinth walk. Friday, August 19th from 6.30, orientation and explanation for first-time walkers. And the walk is from 7 to 9 p.m. Right here in our sanctuary. We remove all the chairs. We lay out a pattern, the labyrinth, copied from Chartres in France. candles or something? I think it's more like 114. But well, I know that Colleen is back there, and she's the one who put batteries in every single one of them. Yes, we replaced the batteries, <laughs> cleaned the corrosion, because it's been three years. And she lived to tell about it. Right. And uh, there'll be practitioners sitting visual. There'll be a, uh, a healing room with prayer in the Mommy and Me room with practitioners. There'll be music. There'll be prayer. There'll be walking. And Saturday, August 20, 20th, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., join our healing walk. Practitioner graduation, woohoo! Sunday, August 21st, at 1.30 in the sanctuary. Brenda, where are you? One of our graduating practitioners. <laughs> Takes four years of study and classes, lots of study and lots of reading to become a practitioner here, or more. Four of our magnificent NHCRS members have successfully completed and passed their practitioner training. Please come and support them and join in the celebration. Our Zoom virtual patio before and after every Sunday and Wednesday services. Zoom meditation every morning, Monday through Saturday from 7.55 to 8.15 a.m. Please visit our website, nhcrs.org, to obtain Zoom links and more information about all our events and to sign up weekly for week, weekly e-blasts and monthly newsletters. I'm out. <laughs> right. Um, along with, you know, another. So, so we're beginning to get to that place where we are knowing and holding the idea that COVID is in our rearview mirror. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, as part of that, that's that's the labyrinth. That's one of the things that is emblematic of us moving back into. We're still doing this um, because we need to still do this, but that labyrinth experience is sacred along with that the other signs that we are moving back into a full functional and well we've always been functional i hope community is that we are starting this fall again with a, a full roster of classes yeah. education is fundamental we do classes so that we change our own lives 
You know, whether you are looking to be a practitioner or a minister or just lift yourself up, I want to encourage you to start looking for the announcements, listening for the announcements when we announce the classes. One of them will be foundations, and that's the one. That's, that's the one when we put that foundation down. Even if you've taken it, take it again, take it again because it's been three years, right? It's been three years. This is where we really, really... Oh, I hate this expression, but it's where the rubber hits the road. It's, uh, you know, but it's where we do it, okay? So I hope that you'll do it. And I'm going to shut up. I'm going to say a prayer. We're going to get out of here, all right? <laughs> Thanks for being here. Oh, and we have some people to thank. I'm sorry. I'm supposed to do that. I always have to remind myself. And by the way, Darius, your music, Darius Lux, iTunes. You could go to iTunes, download it, and take him home with you, and you don't even have to feed him. It's really, really great. Um, Liz Racy held vigil tonight. Dean Regan was doing our Facebook Live support. Zoom support from Alma Alvarez and Lynn Romanowski. In the sanctuary, Adam Keshen has been doing our lights and sound, and he is fabu. Our greeter was Colleen Butler. Our media team, Doreen Reamer. Re Reamer, sorry. <laughs> I've got what you've got. Doreen Remo. Brenda Jordan and Blair Thompson. Okay. Uh, Sam Crutcher was doing our pulpit support. I am Reverend Sidney Steen. Let's pray out, shall we? And we mentioned you already. <laughs> we did. Sam Krieger. Oh, that's fine. Right. Yeah. Okay, so you get two mentions. It's cool. It's Wednesday. You can skip one next time. All right. So we just once again anchor into that awareness that we are guided, guarded, and open-hearted by God, in God, as God, and that all that we need is fully and freely already within us, surrounding us. We are immersed in it, saturated in it, and we let it be so. So I know we go forth as blessings. We bless this church. We bless all churches, all, all churches, all paths to God, mosques, temples, ashrams, whatever the path, we know that God is present. And the intention is love. So we allow this to be so. We say, and so it is. And Yahoo, amen. Let's go get a cup of coffee. But before that, let's all stand and join Darius as we sing, Bless It Always. Bless it. Be ready.